At the root of Plotinus's philosophy are the three principles, beginnings, or hypostasis, that underlie everything we experience. The one, or the good, intellect or being, together with all beings or intellects. Soul or all soul, from which at a lower level, the world soul and individual souls derive. There is the one beyond being. And next in order, there is being and intellect. And the nature of soul is third. And just in nature, there are these three. So we should think that these are also present in us. The sensible or physical world is composed of form and matter and is a reflection or image of the content of soul and is soul of intellect. Even the divine eternal intellect attempts to express in itself the immensity of a principle beyond thought and being, a pure unity of goodness greater than all other unities derived from it, the origin of all things. Intellect and soul, in this sense, are not our intellects and souls, but the great principles from which our much weaker and more divided intellects and souls derive. The hypostases are in us, not like different qualities in our bodies, but in the sense that they are present to us without belonging to us. Soul, intellect, and the one, or good, are essential parts of Plotinus's heritage, though he understands them in rather new ways. He combines Plato's world of forms with Aristotle's notion of the intellect, but in such a way that no form is merely a transcendent object. In other words, all forms or intelligible objects are also subjects or intellects. And every intellect includes the whole of intelligible reality without losing its own distinctiveness. But intellect still is not ultimate for Plotinus, because intellect involves the doubleness of subject thinking and object thought. Plotinus also adopts the Platonic division of reality into two worlds, intelligible and sensible. The soul is the amphibious traveler between these two worlds of eternity and time, inhabitant of both, so that sometimes the intelligible world refers strictly to intellect. But why should they form a hierarchy? Why do we need just these principles? And how are they related to one another? The answer to the first two questions is that Plotinus thinks these hypostases are necessary to account for our ordinary experiences. His treatises typically start from everyday phenomena, such as our experience of beauty and art, and ascend to a deeper understanding of the principles involved, as in Plato's Symposium and Republic. Above all, the hypostases are necessary to account for our experience of degrees of unity and organization. Without unity, no thing would be recognizable as such, neither the simplest elementary compound nor a loosely associated group such as a crowd nor a more highly organized compound, such as a chorus, nor again a different level, a complex living human being. All beings are beings by virtue of unity, both those that are primarily beings and those that are in any way said to be among beings. For what could anything be if it was not one? For neither does an army exist if it is not one, nor a chorus, nor a flock if they are not one. Things depend upon unity to be individual things rather than unity upon individual things. Thus, the organization, beauty, and order of both non-living and living things cannot occur simply by themselves. 
Accounting for them requires a higher degree of unity, namely soul. Moreover, soul is not a pure unity, but a multiplicity of powers, thought, imagination, perception among them. And the soul, too, which is different from the one, has her being more one in proportion to her greater real being. Certainly the soul is not the one itself. For the soul is one, and the one in a sense incidental to her. And these things, soul and one, are two, just like body and one. And what is this continuous like a chorus is furthest from being one, and the continuous body closer. But the soul is still closer even though she participates in it still. While soul and souls possess their own natural order, just as bodies do by virtue of soul, accounting for their unity also requires an organizing principle outside themselves. Soul is a one in many, says Plotinus, that is, an indivisible unity that comes to animate a world of many bodies. And then the soul is many and one, even if it is not composed of parts, for there are a great many powers in her, reasoning, desiring, apprehending, which are held together by the one as by a bond. The soul then brings the one to others, being herself also one, by virtue of something else. Soul's organizing principle, in turn, Plotinus opposes, must be the more intensive unity of intellect, where unity and multiplicity are immediately reflected in each other. Intellect is a one-many, a one-in-many and a many-in-one, a world of intellects in each of which the whole of intellect is present. Each is a sort of holographic reality. Because intellect is a world despite its more intensive unity than soul, according to Plotinus, it cannot be the first principle. For not even is the idea one, but rather a number, both each and the totality. Intellect is of such a kind as to be present to the good and to look to him, but also such as to be present to itself and to think itself. It is further from being the one because it is richly various. There must be a pure, simpler unity beyond intellect, namely the one or the good. Intellect, in fact, splits its vision of that pure simplicity to a world of beings. Did intellect then, when it looked toward the good, think that one as many and being one itself thought him as many, dividing him in itself by not being able to think the whole at once? But the one itself is beyond all intellectual determination a simpler, formless, but more comprehensive presence than that of intellect. But what does it make now? Now too it safeguards those things and makes the thinking things think and the living things live, breathing intellect, breathing life into them, and if anything cannot live, existence. <laughs>